Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. Today, I've got a very special sort of roundtable interview with some of the creative team behind the new Dragon Bean RPG from Free League. I'm joined by Johan, Gabriella, and Thomas. So it's a pleasure to have you on the channel with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So I suppose the first question that I should ask for people outside of Sweden is what is Dragon Bean? Where does it come from? Because while it has a massive history inside Sweden itself, it's kind of unheard of uh, in the outside. Sure. <laughs> who, wants feel, who wants to feel better? Yeah. Uh, well, I, think, I mean, Dragon Bean or Drakar of the Måner, as it's originally called, it's, it's like, it's the, mo most other countries have Dungeons and Dragons when they, back in the 80s when role playing games sort of came came into to the fore mm -hmm. uh, but in Sweden we didn't have that we had Drakar of the Morning which means dragons and demons uh, uh, or dragon bane as it's, as it's called now mm -hmm. uh, and that's what everybody grew up with uh, that's the like the classic fantasy role playing game in Sweden and Sort of in Denmark and Norway as well. They they, they had it there as well. But, but 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 that was that's what our generation, the sort of people born in the in the seventies and early eighties, that's what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. So everybody in the sort of everybody who's tried role playing games, the first game they tried was often Dr. Warner. Uh, so it's it's it's. It's just such a groundbreaking game, and everybody has a sort of. It's it's got so much nostalgia tied into it. So it's um, it's the, yeah, it's what Dungeons and Dragons is everywhere else, yeah. basically. And it had um, a, a sort of a beginning. like emotionally, so to speak. Yeah, uh, it began as uh, a generic fantasy spun off from the Room Quest system from Chaosium. Um, but yeah. Since since then, it seems to have been more developed as a as a world. I think that's right. The first edition, very first edition in eighty two, was a translation of Magic World by Chaosium. That was in turn, I think, a kind of a boiled down, simplified version of Rune Quest. Uh, they did a, back then. I don't think it lived very long in in you know in. In, in English, not that I'm aware of, but that became the first edition of Drakkar de Mona in Sweden. That was, I think, uh, Fredrik Malmberg, who started the Aventurspiel Adventure Games, who published Drakkar de Mona. I think he was an intern at Chaosium like in the early 80s and brought uh, those ideas in that game. Uh, and that is also why the, why it's uh, sort of a RuneQuest uh, basic role-playing type game and not the level-based what you see in Dungeons and Dragons. That kind of goes back to his internship, I think, at, at Chaosio back then. So, And yeah, but then it's quickly evolved into something quite different. I mean, it still has some kind of, some things are still in that same rules-wise or a bit similar still. There are certainly elements still that are kind of trade that you can trace back to those origins. But the game really took off on its own and became its own thing, especially in the 1984 edition, which is the one I think most people here have so at some point played or seen or at least have heard about. It looks like I just actually this one. This is the one that everybody knows in, in Sweden. That's the 84 edition. And already then it had already started to change and take shape. And also like stuff like the art style and so on. There was a new artist, uh, Nils Gullikson, who was very young at the time, and he's kind of set the tone for the entire game. And and, and that also had a, played a huge part. In yeah, I think it was 15 or 16 when it Yeah, something first. like that. Yeah, when he wow. started out. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then it just kind of evolved over the years with a number of different editions by different companies. And I think our edition we're working on now is number 10 or 11 depending on how, how you count there are some different opinions on which are actual editions and which are just kind of you know not true editions you know that's as it tends to to be well these things often creep in i was surprised um i played chronopia the miniatures game mm. and i was surprised to find out that chronopia had originally been written as essentially a spin-off uh, of uh, DoD and yeah, it was, a it, new, it was going to be their new world. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that was the fifth edition or something, fifth yeah. or sixth edition mm. of Drocker de Moner was Cronopia. It started out as an edition of Drocker de Moner. Yeah. And that, the fact that... It was very late 90s. It was very... Yeah. <laughs> everything, <laughs> was everything was cool. <laughs> everything was dark, everything was gritty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was um, a very different take on what had been a, a more sort of traditional fantasy until that point. Uh, and it was fascinating to see that the player base almost rebelled against changing the setting so massively that they ended up going well Cronopia still exists but it exists on this hemisphere of the same planet that up until now had been the, the standard sort of game so approaching a new edition a new version that's going to be opening up this world to a whole range of people who have never seen Dracker before you can take big liberties with it but you have veterans obviously within Scandinavia who are massive fans of this was there a certain amount of trepidation that you didn't want to make not the same mistakes but tread on ground that that isn't what people expect from Dragon Bean when you you decided to start working on it um, I mean from, from our perspective uh, yeah it, it was a bit tricky because we started this out as we're originally we weren't sure we we're going to we we're, we're going to do it in english at all so and it is primarily a new edition of dr Moner, and we decided when we wanted to do it in english it still needed to be the same game we're not doing like two games so it's mm -hmm. it's a direct translation and that meant we had a challenge of explaining the game to the swedish scandinavian audience who are aware and knows it super well and to them you had to explain what's new and what's you know why did we change this and why didn't you keep that and you know whereas for the international audience it's it's more like what is this thing i've never heard of it before so it's a completely different you know have to so that was a bit tricky and uh, but one thing we did because since Dr. Moore is so well known in, in in the swedish context is that we wanted to bring in not not have a small team of just like Two or three people. We wanted to bring lots of different writers for this, and also to give to give their perspective, so that it's not only like one or two people's vision of Doctor Moner, but actually like at least ten or fifteen people who have different approaches to it and have you know been familiar with this game for a very long time, for you know a long time. And that's where Gabriel and, and others came in to to give you know their take. Their mm -hmm. usually, most of them write one adventure each. That's kind of the idea. So uh, that's uh, that's one way we approached it is to, you know, give a bring on many people to give their perspective and then try to tie it all together. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems like an excellent time to talk to Gabrielle then about the writing. When you're giving a, a brief to um, write an adventure or to narrate within this setting, uh, how restrictive was it for you, or were were they relatively sort of open with you you do you this is this is the world that we're going to be playing in and you've got a chance to actually get in and, and input how you viewed uh the the world developing in general like I, this is one of the times where where my writing has been more restrictive but that is not necessarily a bad thing like mm -hmm. uh you know when we got when each of us writers like the writing team who are adding adventures and writing to this world is huge um, and what Free League has done is really have a sort of very clear visions. We were all given like very, like very strict templates um, of what we were doing and discussing early. Okay, what are we doing? What are the rest doing? Um, so it wasn't really like, okay, write something for Dr. Demona. Have fun. Go out. Uh, give it back to us. Mm -hmm. But rather, it was very, it was very well coordinated. Um, but that also meant it sort of had to be restrictive. Um, for it all to sort of match up with the world. Yeah. But as they, you know, they said, it, it was our chance to sort of, each one of us add our own little, uh, how do you say, like little little footprint of ourselves in the world. Um, and one of the fun things is that it's, uh, the writing team is really, really big, but also really wide in the sense that, you know, we have people who me, who, uh, like me, for very sort of new school RPG players. Like mm -hmm. I grew up way past uh, Dr. Nimona. It was a big thing. I was born in 1990. So that game was, you know, when I started playing Wolpern games, uh, we did have Dr. Nimona, but that was like the, the later Ripe Minds edition. Mm -hmm. So like I had, I never had that sort of connections like people who 
grew up with the original editions had it. But then you also have some of the original yeah. creators, you know, mm-hmm. who uh, who wrote the old editions who are coming back. So it's really sort of mixing the old and the new. And I think that's also what's fun is it's not just a retro product. Like there, there was an edition in 2016 that really tried to sort of be like an, a new retro edition of Dark Kingdom Honor. This one feels like a new edition but that more wants to capture the spirits of what the old Dark Animal was. Like it's, you know, it's not a role-playing game from the 1980s, but it wants to be what role-playing game was in the 1980s. And yeah. I think that's a lot of fun too. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of, but I think the important thing with, with Dragon Bane and Dark Animal is that it's, it's got a, the charm in a way is its genericness mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. That it's like, it's a very classic, uh, uh, role-playing game. It's a classic fantasy world, and we, and we want to. Uh, that, that's that sort of. Uh, that, that, that's a that's a feature, not a bug, <laughs> so to say. Uh, and and to really sort of instead of you you want it to be like a classic fantasy role-playing game. That that's yeah. the charm of it, and and uh, and. Um, and I think that that's also why people always liked it because it's quite open. You you can play it very seriously, more like something more like Tolkien. Mm. Uh, but it's also a world where where ducks are a playable race. So there's there's a yeah. I mean the, all, the, all there's something not quite serious about it. There, there, there's a sort of um, um, whimsy to it. Yeah, exactly. A whimsy, exactly. Well, I suppose, uh, yeah. And that, that's always been my... I, I always sort of embraced that. Yeah, you, you don't want to be so tightly so prescriptive in what's in the book that people can't stray within without those those boundaries that you've, you've created. You, you need to have those unexplored areas where here be dragons is possibly... It's a very, it's, there are no boundaries. You can, yeah. you can do a bit... To, you can do whatever you like with it. You, you can play a very serious game or a very serious campaign, or you can play something that's, it can range from sort of Tolkien to Pratchett, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> depending on how you play it. And, uh, I think and, and I, 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 I personally like role playing games that work like that, that, that aren't as constricted, that it's, it's, it's a horror game. It's just a horror game. Yeah. Uh, but, but you can sort of, you can have a horror campaign or you can have a, yeah, there's a, there's an evil duck. Yeah, we, you know, you say evil. I say righteous. Yeah, right. could, could, could yeah. go either way. Yeah, um, I'm quoting a big song. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes sense. Um, yeah. On the subject of the the artwork, you worked on a previous edition, Johan. Yeah, I illustrated the 2016 edition, uh, and then my, my goal was very much to sort of capture that. Mm-hmm sort of old school, medieval, uh, classic fantasy look, mm-hmm. but, but do it in my style and, and do it, uh, my, my style is very influenced from like turn of the century, golden age illustrators like John Bauer and Arthur Rackham, mm-hmm. uh, De Black, all those guys. So I tried to do something in that style and, and, and sort of, but, but really place it in a, it's very tropey, but with a sort of with my style to it. Yeah, yeah. But, but 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 there there is a, an elf should look like an elf, and an orc should look mm-hmm. like an orc. So to try to capture instead of in, instead of trying to, to turn the the archetypes on their head, mm-hmm. you try to create. I try to create the perfect archetypes, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, if you catch my drift, yeah. When you were approaching this, because there's, I've I've seen, and I demanded that ducks should be part of the game. <laughs> I, I played a lot of Glorantha in my youth, and nearly everything that's terrible that's happened to my characters has come at the head of a duck. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm going to be staying well clear of them. Um, but when you're you're approaching something like this, where you have so much artwork going in, and I've seen bits and pieces, uh, did you have a, a list of touch points that you needed you know apart from the, the archetypes and the the kin that had to go in um and then you just set to work and then this is what i produced or were 
other members of the team coming and going, well, I'm writing this scenario and I think it would be great if you could illustrate something for this. Or, or was there was there back and forth within the creative team between art uh, design and narrative over, over the kind of... No, I stuff? think I have pretty loose reins, actually. I think I sort of decided that I want to... I primarily wanted to illustrate characters because that's what I'm good at and that's what I, what I think is fun. Uh, so we had some big illustrations for the beginning of the chapters. And then, then most of the illustrations were of, of different characters and monsters. And that, that's sort of my, to play my strength. And that's what I think, that's when I have the most fun. So it, it was, um, yeah, there was, there was, I wanted to draw characters and make them as character full <laughs> as possible. And with the same thing with the monsters, I wanted to create sort of archetypical monsters. What does a skeleton look like? Like a skeleton warrior, what's the sort of epitome of a skeleton warrior? And I tried to draw that. And when I, when I drew a dragon, I wanted to create like the, the most archetypical classic dragon I could imagine mm. and so on. And I think sometimes I succeeded, sometimes <laughs> straight a bit off the mark, but 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 uh, I think the skeleton is one of the best images yeah. I've uh, done for, and the warrior duck is really cool as well. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I don't think at any point I've looked at any of the illustrations and went, "Oh, Johan has no idea what he's doing there." <laughs> you know, I, I think you're, I think you're on fairly safe ground. Um, can we touch on the the mechanics and the rule side for a moment because it has over the the various editions jumped around from the original Chaosium. Uh, sort of percentile system there was a d20 system uh obviously free league do a lot with their own year zero engine this seems to combine several uh sort of strands of dna from year zero and, and from sort of standard um single die rule system so can you give us a bit of an idea of how that involved and, and works out for play yeah sure yeah we um we did mutant year zero about it's almost a decade ago now and then we that also was a Swedish game uh, by the same company originally. And when we did that, we ripped out almost everything. We did a, a very different system. So Mutant Year Zero changed. And that was about a bit controversial in, in Sweden, that players of previous versions of, of Mutant. Some liked the new system. Some felt that it was you know heresy to change that. So, so that, that was a big thing. Uh, but mutant was always a bit different. It had to, it was it felt that it was possible to do that because it had, like Johan mentioned, Rock of the Mono was always that big generic fantasy game. It did have worlds, but the game was never, for me at least, the world. The original, the early editions did not have any campaign world. That was added on years later. Uh, you know, when the so for me, Rock of the Mono was was that open fantasy game. So that meant if we had ripped out the mechanics and put in something completely different it would not really have felt like Dark and Mono anymore. So it, it had to keep the core of that uh, original, you know, system. And, and even back in the 80s, it shifted between a D100 percentile system and a D20 system. But it was always a skill-based system with a roll-under mechanic. That was always there. Uh, so that we felt we had to keep that because it felt like otherwise we would just stray too far. But then the challenge is that we had when doing the year zero games and, and, and early on, we kind of moved away from, from that uh, percentile or, or, or that kind of role under skill-based system. We had kind of stopped doing games like that. So this was in a sense, a fun challenge to see, can we do a game with that core mechanic uh, and make it, you know, uh, avoid some of the problems that I think that that type of mechanic had had in the past and how can we make that work more streamlined and, bit faster and bring in some of our own ideas, but without changing it so much that it's no longer Rock and Mortar. That was like a big challenge. And whether we succeeded or not, I guess that that you know people have different opinions on. I, you know, <laughs> especially within the Swedish context, there's definitely those who think that we have added too much and changed too much and it's not the true Rock and Mortar experience anymore. So I mean uh, like the healing time, for instance, there's a long debate now in in, in, in some forums that that in the old editions it takes very long time to heal then heal injuries it basically was like one hit point per week or something so if you got hurt you were out of action for months before you could go out adventuring it in our edition we have speeded that up because we felt that's not really 
that doesn't really make adventuring more fun. It just slows things slows down. Pace. So, we, yeah. yeah. But of course, if you want a more authentic experience, you want, you know, that then you might like those slow healing times. So that that is a big thing. But that those are the kinds of issues that we had to kind of grapple with and 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 find our way through when designing this full system. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, there are definitely the core is the old one in a sense. But then we have brought on. Uh, there's some ideas from from our, our other games, like the push mechanic is there, but it's an optional rule. You don't have to use it. And also a, lot, a bunch of new ideas that just appeared when playtesting, because um, we've been playtesting this internally for the last six, seven, eight months, since the beginning of the year, and playing through uh, all of these scenarios and testing out the rules. And a lot of stuff has come up as we played along and just you know, you know come, came out with with ideas and uh so yeah it's a bit of a mix of old uh of the old and, and our new stuff and also influences from other games as, as it you know that's how kind of game design tends to work you get yeah. ideas from all over and then you hopefully combine it into something that is uh, somewhat uh, unique and your own in the end and then we'll see whether people feel we succeeded but that was at least the the goal the game itself looks like it's it's fairly fleshed out and complete um and I've noticed one of the things on the, the Kickstarter page itself was that essentially you can do your own sort of open source if people want to write adventures and the like for it, um, which is always an excellent thing to see to encourage community growth. Um, will you still be adding to the, the catalog of, of uh, books for the game itself over time? Or do you see this as a, a sort of a here's the entry point this this is what we want to do with the game and then if the community want to run with it they can um i mean both really we are definitely planning expansions and modules for the game and we have like a two two approaches that will make some uh, new editions of, of classic dr Mona adventures that will also be both in english and swedish they will be updated in terms of rules and also content wise and but was trying to keep them fairly i mean just you know, not totally change them but still keep the core but then we're also going to do completely new new stuff uh, as well. So we're going to be doing both of those in parallel. So we're planning quite a lot. But then, yes, the third party and the community uh, content is something that we feel strongly about and, and looking forward to doing. I, uh, you know, maybe it, it, we'll see. Primarily, we thought that would be mostly perhaps for the Swedish side because mm -hmm. there the game is so well known. So, the, you know, there's a lot of people who probably would think it's fun to write for Dr. Mother because it's like the... The most well-known yeah. role-playing game, but hopefully even outside. I mean, for from from the international side as well, that it can be some interest in doing third party. We do a lot of that in the freely workshop that we have, the community content program on Drive mm -hmm. Through RPG, where we have for most of our other games, uh, you can sign up and publish stuff uh, for them. I think the difference for this one is that it's going to be an even more open license, so it it, it will be possible to create your own modules and, and print them and sell them anywhere you want. It's not going to be limited to drive through RPG or PDFs. It can also be in print or, or anything. You just need to follow a few simple rules and, and then you're basically free to create any module that you like for the game. That sounds fantastic. And I'd be fascinated to see what the community come up with whenever they manage to get their hands on the, the game itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, I'm I'm a huge fan of fantasy games, and this one just seems to uh, tick all the boxes for me as possibly a crusty old gamer, uh, <laughs> but but also somebody who enjoys seeing what the community come up with. And uh, over the years, community sort of driven games seem to have the longevity uh, yeah. far beyond um, a, a lot of other games that that potentially should you know be overshadowed, but when the community is on board they they just have a momentum of their own and carry it along with them so it'll be yeah. terrific to see how this this approaches in the long run I mean, uh, yeah. a great example of that is uh, murkborg uh, mm. which is a game that has really thrived so much because of having such a like big community but also yeah. a license that makes it really easy to create content so um i mean uh, i was out the other day with a couple of other people involved with the game and just hearing one of them him, who's also like writing one of the adventures but hearing him sort of laying out his plans of oh this is what i'm gonna do with mm -hmm. the with the license already is is really fun to look forward to and to see how you know people are already making plans of things to release um mm -hmm. so it's gonna be really fun and hopefully it'll thrive 
but it looks like it. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think it will without a doubt. Um, you know, a big fantasy, I wouldn't say genre defining because you want it to be all things to all people, but mm. having the tool set there uh, to get in and get involved uh, it always, always bodes well for the, the long term. And uh, as always, I mean, Free League's work is, is absolutely magnificent. You may see some of them lurking over my head. Where are we? There. So mm -hmm. that's half of them. The other half are that way. Um, and I've always been stunned by the, the not just level of detail, but the quality and the, the sort of love that's been pushed into the books. Um, they, they just are an absolute whole other level. Uh, when you you come to look at them as uh, as art pieces in and of themselves, and the fact that I can sit around the table and uh, play games with my friends make it so much the better. Uh, but it's been absolutely lovely taking the time to sit down and talk to you. Good luck for the remaining couple of weeks of the campaign, and uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing what uh, Freely come up with next and how De uh, Dragon Bane, I almost said Demon Bane, don't go all chaotic. Mm. Dragon Bane uh, goes from strength to strength over the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.